to our monthly Know Your Ocean Speakers series. Um, or as I like to call it tonight, Monday Night at the Movies. We've got uh, a real treat for you. Um, we have a special guest, Dan Dennison, who will uh, provide our presentation tonight. Um, my name is Mike Fogarty. I'm proud to be one of the members of the Board of Directors for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. And um, I'll be here to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, we'd also like to give a big mahalo to Maui Ocean Center. Uh, they support us in many ways. They provide this wonderful venue for our monthly uh, speaker series. And uh, tonight, as you can see, there's a special um, treat. They're going to show the humpback whale. Uh, Hawaii humpback whales. It's You'll really enjoy it. We'll, uh, we'll do that after our short Q&A, after our presentation. Uh, so stick around and we'll pass out those 3D glasses. Our guest presenter tonight is Dan Dennison. He's a senior communications manager from the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, he will introduce us to a new initiative from the Department of Aquatic Resources known as the Coral Pledge. So uh, yeah, during his talk, he will also feature a showing of Saving Coral. It's a half hour television special produced by DLNR to educate the public about threats to Hawaii coral reefs. So a double feature tonight. Bear with me, I don't usually do this type of stuff. <laughs> so, who are we? Uh, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, we're a small nonprofit. we're pretty lean. We only have three full-time staff on board. And we get a lot of work done, they do an amazing job. We're all about healthy coral reefs, clean ocean, and abundant native fish. Uh, a couple of things here before we get started. I want to tell you that uh, I would like to ask you to silence your cell phones. And uh, as far as restrooms, they're down around the corner and out the door. I uh, also want to let you know that Akaku Community Television is filming tonight's presentation. And we're also streaming it on our Facebook Live tonight. So just a few updates on some of our programs. Our water monitoring, water quality monitoring continues to roll on. We have 35 volunteers who uh, check 41 sites about uh, every three weeks. And uh, they're testing for 13 parameters at each site. So our, sorry about that. Our, uh, the HUI was, is a joint, uh, I, would, I would say joint venture, it's co-founded and it's co-managed by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, the Nature Conservancy, and West Maui Rich the Reef Initiative. And we participate, or we're partnering with the state of Hawaii's Department of Health, or Clean Water Branch. So everything we do meets the standards of the Department of Health, and that way that Valuable information can be shared um, throughout the ecosystem. Our lab space, I want to uh, give a shout out to the uh, National Marine Sanctuary here in Kihei and also to the um, Lahaina Luna High School in, on West Maui because they provide the valuable lab space that we need to carry out that program efficiently. Also, I want to give a shout out to our supporters for the HUI program. It's a very important program. Uh, we're still working hard to make sure we get funding for next year. We're pretty well set up uh, to get us through the end of this year and maybe into the spring, but we, we still need funding to keep the program going. I want to give a special shout out to the County of Maui Office of Economic Development 
and Hawaii Tourism, and all of our corporate sponsors that you see on the screen there. One of our biggest programs, or projects I should say, that we're attempting in 2020, um, this is a big one, it's, um, it's improving the water quality here in Malaya Bay. And I know you all know about the fires that sweep through this area a lot. And you know what it does to the ground cover upslope across the highway. Um, it denudes the soil and all of that sediment flows down into the harbor and then out into Malay Bay. So it's, it's quite a challenging project. But we did recently receive a large grant, $300,000 from the um, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, that's the good news. Um, the other part of that equation is that we're going to need oh, over $400,000 in matching funds to be able to carry out this project. Um, so uh, that grant will allow us to establish and improve fire breaks and strategically placed corridors inside the Boakea watershed. And those fire breaks will help to mitigate the pervasive cycle of fires, wildfires, and protect over 3,400 acres of forest reserve in Malaya. So in January, phase one will start and uh, we'll engage more than 10 partner organizations and community volunteers to create fuel breaks and establish fire resistant plants. Uh, we'll also install oysters in Malaya Harbor. That's a very interesting project. It's a, um, it's a kind of a test or a pilot project to see if we can use these filter feeders to clean the water in the harbor as they have in other successful projects in the United States like New York Harbor and Chesapeake Bay. So we'll need a lot of dedicated volunteers for these two projects alone. And if you're interested in that, Amy Hodges, our program manager, uh, will oversee those projects. And you can reach Amy at Amy at Maui Reefs, that's plural, reefs.org. Another uh, project, and this is the uh, final one I'll give you a brief on, we're doing some visitor education. <clears throat> it's quite obvious we have enough visitors, we don't need to go out and solicit those visitors, so what we're doing is taking steps in a project uh, in conjunction with the County of Maui, uh, Economic, uh, Office of Economic Development, the Hawaii Tourism Association, and the Maui uh, Visitors Bureau. Uh, we're in the process now of installing signage in the airport, so the first thing our visitors will see are some ideas and some tips and just some little, you know, reminders that the coral is living and uh, all of those precautions we all know you need to take uh, to keep them from becoming injured. Um, there's, along with that project, there's a, a, another part and that is to replace all of these beach signs that you've seen at your favorite beach that have been there for 10, 15, 20 years perhaps and they're now unreadable and, um, somewhat um, scarred, etc. So we'll be replacing those throughout the next few months. So you knew that was coming. That means we're getting towards the end of my little spiel. Um, we do appreciate all of the generous support that many of you, all of you, uh, provide for us. and. We, we, do, uh, we do appreciate that. We have a, uh, a local donor, a very faithful donor, who has upped the ante just for this holiday season uh, until the end of the year. They'll match your donation one to one up to $5,000. So let's put them to work. When you do donate, we got a few little gifts for you if you want to uh, meet a certain threshold. So. Uh, you can find all of this on our website at MauiReefs.org. So please have a look at that. Once again, I want to thank all of our supporters, corporate sponsors, and donors like you, as they say. 
and keep our programs running and keep us moving forward. We're very grateful. Just a quick note on next month's um, speaker. That will be on Wednesday. Wednesday is our usual day, first Wednesday of every month, to have our speaker series. Uh, next meeting, January the 8th, will be Dwayne Sparkman. And he's going to talk to us about preventing ocean pollution, proven alternatives to herbicides and pesticides for your home, business, and landscaping. So that's a very interesting subject, and I hope you all will join us for that, for that presentation. So let me get on to presenting our speaker this evening. I'm going to read a little short bio here. Dan is actually a very cool guy. Dan Dennison currently serves as a senior communications manager for the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. Dan brings more than four decades of broadcast journalism experience to his current position. Prior to joining DLNR in 2014, Dan served as news director at six top-rated television stations in four states, including KHON Channel 2 and KHNL Channel 5 in Honolulu. He began his news management career in his native Colorado after being a television reporter and a photographer for 25 years. He was covering Western Colorado for Denver television stations at that time. He has multiple Emmy Awards, State Broadcaster Association Awards, and the Edward R. Murrow Award. State Broadcasters Association Awards, etc. He was a reporter and a news director. At DLNR, Dan, Dan has been responsible for the production of more than 1,000 videos to date, including seven television specials. He supervises a team of communication specialists who handle all internal and external communications and media relations and social media. Dan has served on numerous state and national boards, both as a broadcaster and now as a government communications professional. Please welcome Dan Dennison. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Now this is going to show my uh, technical ignorance. We've got to get out of one and put another one up here. So bear with me for one moment. Okay. Well, thank you. Good evening and aloha. Um, I'm just uh, tremendously honored and privileged to speak uh, to a crowd which I expect is a lot like uh, speaking to the choir. Uh, you guys wouldn't be here if you weren't concerned about our oceans and our, our coral reefs as we are. Uh, Mike mentioned something that is so critical to, to the work that we do in government. I think sometimes people get the notion that government can do everything by themselves and alone. Uh, my six years, almost six years at DLNR, I've learned that uh, government certainly can't do it alone. And I came in with a pretty jaundiced eye about government, having been a journalist for 40 years, where we're pretty much trained and ingrained to look down our noses at, at bureaucrats and the work that government does. But um, I, I will tell you that I've just been uh, so tremendously pleased to, to see the other side of the equation and to learn that government functions only well when it involves uh, collaborative decision making and uh, partnerships, both with uh, private public partnerships and certainly with uh, NGOs and nonprofits that we work with around the state, including the Maui Nui uh, Marine Resources Council. So um, you guys have definitely the best venue for your, your monthly meetings. And uh, a quick apology, I would have made it last Wednesday, but I thought I was gonna have shoulder surgery Tuesday and I realized, oh, Christmas is three weeks away. I think I'll wait till after the holidays. So I said, can you push it uh, forward a week or so, and so that's exactly what happened. Uh, tonight I want to talk a little bit about the, the Coral Pledge, uh, saving coral, and toward the end, uh, Governor Ige's 30 by 30 um, marine initiative, and let you uh, uh, get an update on that. Uh, but as we all know, the, the coral uh, reef systems are the truly the ocean's foundation. Uh, when NOAA predicted some pretty serious and widespread coral bleaching, uh, probably in August this year, uh, they contacted us because we always collaborate on communications for coral bleaching events, and this is the third, as you probably know, the third serious one in the last five years, or predicted serious one. And so a team from our Division of Aquatic Resources uh, 
And my office got together and decided on uh, a pretty proactive approach this year, and we're going to ask, uh, there'll, there'll be an ask later on, no money involved, just your, your hearts and your souls, and maybe a little bit of work on the internet to get involved in the Coral Pledge, and as Mike mentioned, we'll be showing uh, Saving Coral as well here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, the Coral Pledge, as I was talking, tell me your name again, I'm sorry. Anthony, I was talking to Anthony, who is one of the tour boat operators. Uh, they, it was originally targeted for uh, commercial tour boat operators, uh, commercial tour companies, the folks who run the buses, and it was basically just to get the folks who are encountering the, what, 10 and a half million visitors predicted for next year, uh, many of them who go into the ocean, to get them knowledgeable and aware of some really simple steps about how to uh, act pono around our coral reefs. As you'll see in, in the TV special in a moment, um, I live about a mile from Hanama Bay, so I spend a great deal of time up there snorkeling. And it just, and I'm sure for you folks as well, it just drives me absolutely bonkers when I see people walking on the reef. And the day I went out to get examples of people walking on the reef, well, lo and behold, here's a guy who walked on the reef for about five minutes, and even after I told him not to do it. So I got my video, but I, every time I see that, I, it just drives me absolutely crazy. Um, we're really proud to have the Maui Ocean Center as one of the founding signatories of the Coral Pledge, and you can see the list of the other folks that have signed off, uh, signed up so far. I, mean, I think last check there's about 14, and hopefully by uh, this time in January we'll double or triple that number. And uh, you'll learn that as individuals you can sign up to take the pledge too and help spread the word amongst the, the people that you interact with on a, on a daily basis. Uh, this is the Coral Pledge, and we'll talk more about it in a moment, but it really has six simple uh, points. Let fish protect reefs, corals like their space, stand on the sand, use reef-safe sunscreen, contain chemicals, and anchor your boats away from reefs. Uh, we revealed this at a news conference at the Waikiki Aquarium on November 5th, and it became, as you'll see in just a moment, a key component of the television special Saving Coral that aired on K5 TV on November 8th and November 14th. You can watch it anytime online. Uh, I don't expect you to write that down, but if you go to our Facebook page or the DLNR Vimeo page, you can find it really easily and you can watch it anytime. It's, oh, let me go backwards here. Um, it's just really great to be able to uh, see it on the, the big round screen here in the sphere. And so uh, we'll talk more about the Coral Pledge and update on the 3030 Marine Initiative, but right now we'll show you Saving Coral. We have to protect what we have. There's so much outside stressors that's happening, you know, with runoff, pesticides, you know, now we got sunscreens. Now we do provide complimentary reef safe sunscreen. Guys, I got a bunch up here by me. We got a bunch down below in the main cabin as well. Tourism, there's a lot of things that's pressuring the corals and you know, it, it makes me worried because for me, I want to be sure that you know, coming from a fishing family, it's, it's very important that my kids grow up the same way that, that we did, you know, and be able to utilize our resources and, and also take care of them because pretty soon, without the corals here, especially with the bleaching that's going to be happening that we're anticipating, you know, that could, um, coral reef collapse could happen. And with that happening, the fish won't have a home, they end up moving away, and, you know, there'll be no resources for everybody to enjoy. That's Adam Wong, and I'm Brian Nielsen, and that's my wife, Eva, and daughter, Mia. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Luna Kikoa, enjoying a day at the beach with my wife, Pahale, and Keiki Naulu, Keahe, and Mahina. E ho'omau i kekoa. In Hawaiian, this means preserving our coral reefs. Adam, Luna, and I are just three of the many people across Hawaii committed to saving coral for our keiki and for all future generations. If you've been in Hawaii for any time at all, you already know that coral reefs are the very foundation of life in the ocean. They're living animals that support many other creatures. And our way of life in both the sea and on land. Hawaii's coral reefs, like reefs around the world, are under siege. They're on the verge of being lost forever. This means unless each of us does our part to save coral, we risk losing these beautiful, productive, and fragile ecosystems. As Brian said, to save coral, we all need to malama them and think about what we do in the ocean and on land, and whether our actions are pono. 
We'd like you to meet all kinds of people and groups around Hawaii who are making saving coral their mission. It's like a funnel. So as the surf hits, this coral goes out and it comes through that opening. Please listen to their stories. From their words and their actions, we can all learn about saving coral. Ultimately, it is about our children, their children, and their grandchildren. Hawaii without coral is not a Hawaii as we know it. So it's fitting we first return to Adam, who spends a lot of time talking to KK about saving coral. The water, the water, our water Right? We're surrounded by water. Period. We're surrounded by water. We have many, many corals, many fishes that live in Hawaii. So, common sense. We better protect that, right? Because if we don't want that, Hawaii not going to be Hawaii. We're not going to have the the beautiful surf spots, the beautiful beaches. You guys not going to be able to go and enjoy and do that kind of stuff. Now, the bomb is alive. Coral is a very delicate animal. If we don't take care, then we're going to end up with nothing, okay? A coral reef has all these working parts, okay? Just like one car. One car needs gas, needs spark, needs carburetor, needs tires, needs all that stuff. If you get one car, no more tires, what? Where are you going? No hell, you're not going to go nowhere. If you get on car, minus the gas line, where are you going? Nowhere, okay? Just like on coral reef, you got to have all these pieces that can work, make this puzzle work. Because they get rid of a lot of the invasive algae, which means they need to move for more You're taking out the, the corals, what would happen? Gonna fall down, okay? You guys whole tower gonna fall down on the ground. It's gonna be dust. We, we're gonna end up with coral reef collapse. And this is what coral reef collapse looks like, okay? It's that simple of just pulling out one of the key players on a coral reef. You can end up with something like this. And this is what we wanna stay away from. Because <coughs> reefs, coral reefs has a hard time recovering once we enter, enter this stage. Reef education happens in classrooms. And many, many organizations and even commercial tour companies are joining efforts to save coral. For us, it is people like you that make a big difference. And, and we will be sharing your difference. Yes, absolutely. The Kahalulu Bay Education Center on the Hawaii Island is a program of the Kahala Center. They educate dozens, even hundreds of visitors every day. And because of what's happening to the reef here, they're taking simple steps to save coral in the bay while they contemplate some very drastic measures. Right now, we see a bay that is being loved to death. It is in uh, disrepair. Uh, we find that our corals are suffering. They are in decline. And Kahalu is a bay that um, has more of the, of the major stressors uh, affecting it. Um, pollution runoff, cesspool um, 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 areas right next to it. Um, we have um, thousands of people that come to the Bay every year. Some of the stressors like uh, cesspool conversion or pollution runoff, climate change, are very difficult uh, to mitigate immediately. But with sunscreen, we can do it immediately. When the corals are spawning, look at days to close. And also look at carrying capacity on all of our bays that are being loved to death. And if we can work together, and I think the, the, um, the formula is just that. The federal, state, local, community, Families of the land working together to heal here, Kahalu Bay, or in different areas, for instance, Hanama Bay. It is all of us, because I believe together we can make a difference. <coughs> Hawaii Island where 
people will continue to come and enjoy it. And also our children will have a place that they can really appreciate and respect. So I think everyone here is, is aware that last year the state of Hawaii passed legislation um, banning the sale of certain chemicals and sunscreens that have been shown to be harmful to coral reef ecosystems when they're present in the water in large concentrations. So in particular, we designed a survey to try to better understand what's the prevalence of these banned chemicals and sunscreens that are currently being used um, in, on beaches in Hawaii. So it was both to try to understand what would be the potential impacts of the ban once it goes into effect, and then also to understand how aware are people and to inform education outreach strategies. And where are people learning about the information and are there other ways that we can get this information out? You guys sampled already, right? Did you get it in the water already? No. I might be too late, but I'm just asking everybody to try to use only something that has a zinc or titanium oil. It's been recognized for generations that the coral reefs are the foundation of our life in the islands. And it's not just economics about visitors. It's about fishing. It's about surfing. Without these reefs, uh, and we could lose them, it would be very, very different. Um, but there's so many impacts right now, we've got to... That's our challenge, is we're just asking each, each person to make that personal choice themselves. Protect yourself, but do it in the right way. Many weekends you can find a sunscreen swap somewhere in the islands. In addition to only using reef-safe sunscreens, you can protect yourself with clothing like rash guards, hats, and simply staying in the shade. We're excited to see so many people and groups focusing on this. Every little step will contribute to helping save our coral. Even our millions of visitors are getting educated about coral practices. Many of the people and companies that host visitors are signing on to the Coral Pledge. This is a concerted and organized effort to inform as many guests as possible about why it's so important to do their part saving coral. The Coral Pledge is straightforward. Commercial tour operators and other enterprises just agreed to share simple, common sense steps to avoid injuring or stressing coral. Every day of every week, thousands of people hop on board boats and buses to get in the water to experience Hawaii's dazzling underwater vistas. Before the introduction of the Coral Pledge, many Hawaii companies were already informing folks. Imagine how wonderful it would be if there was pono fishing on our coral reefs. If people stopped walking on them, sitting on them, touching them. If everyone understood that Hawaii's coral reefs are not only the foundation of the ocean, but fundamental to our economy. No corals, a lifeless ocean, and no reason for people to come to Hawaii to enjoy it. One of the goals of Dizzy's Animal Cleaning <coughs> Department is to actually educate our guests about environmental issues. So Rainbow Reef is a unique, unique experience for our guests. It's a man-made snorkel lagoon. It was designed and built to look like a, to look and feel like a real coral reef. So guests can snorkel in there, learn about coral reefs and, and the fishing in, inside the reefs to come and get a, a feel for it before they actually go out and snorkel in the wild. The corals that we have, although they are not real, we treat everything in there, especially the corals, even though they're not real, like they are real. It helps us to remember that corals are living animals. And if we step on them, if we kick them, it's very damaging and it's destructive. And so we do not want to do that. So we ask if you can please not step on the rocks, and if you cannot step on the corals, you just want to stay swimming. Uh, Bethany said that the girls didn't want to touch the reef because they had heard her say they shouldn't step on the reef and they were very, very careful to live, keep their feet off of the reef. So the message does get through. I think especially to the young people because they take it very seriously that this is their future. All right, guys, we're here. We made it. Beautiful, historic Keala Kekua Bay. <laughs> this is the famous site where Captain James Cook of the British Royal Navy made landfall in the winter of 1779. For your own safety and the health of the reef, guys, we ask you guys, please, stay off the bottom. Don't touch anything. Don't stand up anywhere. And do not climb ashore to Captain Cook Monument. Like I said, your own safety, but also the health of the reef. We've been in business almost 50 years now. Uh, and we see around 60,000 or so pounds.
passengers um, through our boats. We definitely are aware of the impact that we all make and that we need to try and do our best with what we have to keep it as good as possible. But with things like uh, global warming, it definitely gets to a point where sometimes it's bigger than what we can do here. And so we do as much as we can to support all those types of efforts, uh, single-use plastic, all that type of stuff. Um, the boats run on biodiesel. I have a son, and uh, so everything we do, you know, we think about that being our, uh, our big reason. So, you know, the next generation is, is absolutely going to be the ones that have the, the real next step at being able to fix the problem, but yeah, absolutely optimistic in, in the sense that we have lots of options for doing it, so um, it's it's definitely something where it's real, so there's as much a worry as there is as an opportunity. There was as many as 18 when we first got out here. He would say it's it's definitely too many. It's, um, the place was created in 1978 because it was such a unique kind of example of a core reef ecosystem. It's in the middle of the channel here. Offshore, and um, it's it's actually smaller, believe it or not, than Panama Bay uh, inside of this this area. So to put that many boats uh, with some of them 150 passengers or more is uh, a lot, right? You're looking at at some sometimes probably 12 to 1500 people in here at one time, and so that that has an effect. And we can't necessarily measure all of those effects exactly, but we have been able to. Uh, to look at what happens to some of the reef predators that are more mobile, and we found clear signs that once there's more than 12 boats, 50% um, of them or more are displaced from the area, particularly the bluefin trevally or the O'Neill. This, this is a premier tourist destination. It's advertised as such. These companies um, depend on being able to take people out here to sell their trips on a trip to Molokini, and, and they sell it as kind of a pristine, out of its way nature experience. And so, so we did do a study looking at social caring capacity as well. It was found that about 50% of the people felt that once there was 12 boats or more, uh, or somewhere between 12 to 15, depending on the size of the boats, that um, that was too many, that they felt that was crowded. They get that intuitively and philosophically. In fact, they'll tell you they're, you know, they're some of the best um, stewards of the marine environment because it's their livelihood and their business. And there's certainly some truth to that in that people go on these trips, they're educated, they're supervised, and, and we hope that if they're taught the right things, that every time they go snorkeling on their own throughout the trip, that they're following that advice and behaving better as a result of it. So, so there's a lot of benefit that can come from the tour industry. It's, it's hard to, to see yourself as a direct part of the problem, right? And although a lot of them privately will agree that it's crowded and it's chaotic out here, as a group, they don't want to say that. I don't know, it, it's a difficult dynamic, but I, I do think they, they get it. They just haven't been super willing to concede that fact, particularly for Molokini at this point. Overall, I think natural ecosystems are resilient. They can adapt, they can adjust. We just have to do what we can to give them the space to do that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm optimistic. I mean, I, I, there's no doubt things are going to be different. The reefs are not going to be what we grew up used to. Uh, but corals should survive, um, and reefs should continue to adapt and adjust, even as other things change, as long as we address what we can from local stressors. And fishing, particularly heavy fishing of herbivore fish that play a critical role on the reef. And because of their life history, they're not able to adapt to heavy fishing pressure as well as other species of fish might be able to. And so hopefully we can, we can do a better job of that. We can address land-based pollution um, and better control sedimentation, set up better natural coastal ecosystems to filter that stuff out. Russell pretty much summed up the core approach. <laughs> Our visitor industry is front and center and absolutely critical to saving coral. We invite tour operators and anyone who has direct contact with people going into the ocean to swim, snorkel, surf, kayak, stand up paddle, fish or boat, to sign the pledge and incorporate its simple, straightforward tips into information and education presentations. 
Saving Koro is similar to the concept of it takes a village to raise a child. It's going to take all of us doing our parts to ensure beautiful reefs for the future. Across the state, there are numerous projects on the way to give our coral reefs a helping hand. One is the state of the Inuit Coral Ministry. What we're doing here is fast growing coral <coughs> colonies, Hawaiian coral colonies. We're only growing Hawaiian coral. And we're experimenting with a variety of species, but we're sticking primarily to the reef building corals. We have really good reefs that are degrading, and we have corals in our harbors that provide us with a unique source of coral material because we don't want to be moving corals from natural reefs to natural reefs because it impacts one reef to benefit another. So what Norton's doing right now is taking a picture of the coral prior to cutting it so we can see what coral we're working with and we can reverse course prior quality tracks and know what exact quality we need to go. Because this hasn't really been done before, we needed a place where we could easily uh, monitor the status of, of these outplants, look for any problems that may occur, check their growth rates, their natural growth rates. Remember that we're fast growing them in the coral nursery. Uh, but once we put them out into the wild, they go back to the same growth rates every other coral in Hawaii is growing at, which on average is about one centimeter a year. It's amongst the slowest growth rates of corals anywhere in the world. And those slow growth rates make it very hard for reefs to recover naturally from human impact. So that's why we're giving them a little bit of help. When we transplant corals out in the natural reef environments, we have to acclimate them because in the coral nursery, they're basically, it's like being in a five-star hotel. They're, they're given all the, the best food, the best lighting, the best water conditions. They're given lots of tender, loving care. And, and together, this allows these corals to grow at a fast rate. Once we put them back into natural waters, what ends up happening is that growth rate slows down and we have to slowly acclimate them back to the not pristine water that we have surrounding our, our shallow water reef environments. HIMD is the only scientific reserve in the state. So it has protected area status, very limited activities, there's no fishing, there's no trolling and stuff in here. HIMD is the University of Hawaii's Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology on Coconut Island and Kaneohe Bay. It, too, is doing cutting-edge research and projects to help our coral reefs along. It's also one of the sites of Hawaii's first coral palooza, held in the summertime to celebrate World Oceans Day. Built as the largest one-day active reef restoration project, it gave Dave and his team another opportunity to put some coral modules from the nursery into a protected natural environment. Back in the classroom on Maui, Adam Wong's fishing class gets a stark but comic reminder of all the perils coral reefs face. See the decline of fish, like the lobster holes that I used to go to, the moi holes, the hole, the kumu, they're not there, okay? They've been displaced, we're overfishing them, something's happening, okay? So we're getting a lot of reduction in these species. So in this comic, you get a kid, you can go talk to an owner, um, an aquarium store. So what the kid is saying, he say, mister, what do I need to create a realistic marine environment? Okay? So what you're doing, you're trying to build his aquarium at home. So what the owner says to him, he said, in order to be realistic, you gotta get agricultural runoff, coastal <laughs> overdevelopment, unconscious sewage, and depleted fish species. What he pretty much saying is that if you wanted to have a realistic marine environment and you wanted to create that on your own, this is all the stuff that we're facing right now. On Maui, we're facing runoff. We're, we're facing overdevelopment, okay? We're facing overfishing. These are all issues that's happening within the communities, that's happening on our coral reefs. Our KP are the best hope for reversing course and ultimately for saving coral. <laughs> From young ages, they're learning about the threats to our reefs. Much like nature builds reefs, we adults must provide a solid foundation of understanding appreciation, and malama to pass on. It's what I want for my kiki. I also want them to understand that not only is koa or in Hawaiian koa really important for the health of the ocean, koa is key to our culture. Dad, I can be part of our Hawaiian culture. Oh, great question, Ali. There's a lot of places where koa is in our Hawaiian culture, starting with the kumuliko. Right, so it's a creation chant, the genealogy of the Hawaiian people. And coral is one of the first things for So 
because it's one of the first points, the answers are Kapuna, right? So it's one of our connections to the coral, is that connection back to the resources. And the corals are the foundation of the Korean ecosystem. And now? And now. Do you remember Kopolavik? Yep. Yeah, so remember when we went to the fishing co-op? Mm -hmm. What do you remember from? I think coral? Yeah, so there's some coral on top, and then I went about on the auto door when we walked out. I also want Mia to grow up to know from a very young age that everything we do or don't do will help determine if Hawaii has healthy, vibrant coral reefs for eons to come. When you think about everything you've heard and learned today, it's not terribly difficult. Yes, we'll all have to make some tough decisions, but in the long run, we must take steps to protect, preserve, and perpetuate Hawaii's coral reefs. Our way of life depends on saving coral. Our call to action for you begins with reminders from the people you've seen and heard already. We encourage everyone to take the coral pledge. All of them. Sometimes we like them just to like a rock to them, but the corals are like that, so it's very important for them to not step on the reef or touch them. Please don't feed the fish, because um, that changes their behavior. To address land-based pollution um, and better control sedimentation, set up better natural coastal ecosystems to filter that stuff out. You know, it, it, it's a slow, painful process, but I think the more we can do that, the more likely the reefs can adapt and adjust over time. Uh, it's still something that I love to be able to share with people to see, because no matter if you've seen it before or not, at this point we can still see it and we still have a chance to help uh, make sure that someone else might see it after. Sunscreen won't reduce all the damage that's happening to our race. There's problems with sedimentation and ocean warming and acidification, but one straw that we can take off the camel's back, and I believe is one swimmer at a time, one snorkel at a time, one surfer at a time, is the sunscreen. The sunscreens that we now use, modern sunscreens, have some toxicity problems. Well, I bet we all wish we had this guy's name so we could write him some dirty letters, so. <laughs> I, I should have timed that shot, but I bet he walked across that reef for two and a half, three minutes. And granted, the interior of Hanama Bay is mostly rubble at this point in time, but it was just the, the notion that he supposedly watched the film and understood what not to do. And even after I told him, he persisted, so. That's one of the issues that we have to deal with now. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this, hopefully. Well, thank you for watching, appreciate that. So as I said, we announced the Coral Pledge uh, back the, around the first, uh, of, and I says December 5th, I didn't edit this very well, it was actually November 5th. Had a lot of media coverage. Uh, Noah provided an update on coral bleaching. You may have heard uh, the good news is it wasn't as uh, serious uh, as they first predicted, probably as widespread. 
Uh, it really depends on where you were at. There were some places off Maui Nui where they found some pretty serious bleaching, other places where it wasn't nearly as bad as it was in 2015 and 2016. But uh, obviously, I think you all know this, this is something we're gonna face for uh, many, many years to come, uh, probably for the rest of our lives. And so the Coral Pledge was really designed to reduce those stressors that the human caused stressors, not only during times of bleaching, but forever at, at all times, so that when corals are into these situations, they at least have a fighting chance to, to thrive and survive. Uh, I wanted to go back here. I wanted to read uh, the Coral Pledge real quick. You can see it up there, but corals are an essential part of life in Hawaii. They support an abundance of life on the reef, protect our homes and businesses from storm events, and provide amazing beauty for people to enjoy snorkeling and diving. Corals are currently under major threat due to rising ocean temperatures, sea level rise, pollution, and unsustainable fishing practices. Coral bleaching used to be a rare occurrence in Hawaii, but we now have experienced three major coral bleaching events in the past few years, resulting in major die-offs of corals throughout the state. While warm ocean temperatures are the direct cause of bleaching, we can all take steps to minimize human impacts and help save our reefs. In our global state of climate change to interact with our natural resources responsibly is to minimize our impact on our natural environment. By following and promoting the acts outlined on the other side of this card, you are committing to practices that help to conserve our coral reefs. Thank you for joining the DLNR Division of Aquatic Resources and the stewardship of our treasured coral reefs. Your commitment to conservation of our marine environments will set a standard for all marine resource users. We're looking forward to expanding this community of environmental leaders to work together to protect the very environments that sustain our lives and livelihoods in Hawaii. And again, this is the uh, uh, Coral Pledge. The actual pledge has undergone some uh, iterations over the past couple of months, but the messages are unchanged, and you've seen those uh, many, many times. But this is the, the card that we're going to provide to tour operators, anyone who asks. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to give cards to, to everyone, but we're, again, the hope is that the, the people who actually interact with our visitors will have these cards and can read them and, and answer questions based on the cards. Uh, what's next? As I said, bleaching will be back, and in, in those uh, situations, we'll reinvigorate our public and media communications about the Coral Pledge. Uh, some new news, beginning with uh, license and permit renewals in 2020, Commercial ocean permittees and commercial fishermen will have to read the Coral Pledge as a requirement for renewal. We can't make it mandatory, but this is really a voluntary thing, and I think most people are uh, you know, spirited and, and have the, the hearts to, to actually read the pledge and hopefully share it with their guests. Uh, currently, there are 37 commercial fishing license holders and 863 commercial use permits for activities in nearshore waters and at state small boat harbors around Hawaii. So that's a pretty significant number of people that we can reach immediately. And we're going to kick this off with another round of media uh, next week sometime. So you're the first to, to learn about it. Uh, you can sign on to the Coral Pledge. It's a little hard to see there, but if you go to uh, dealernr.hawaii.gov slash dar, it's on the front page, and it's really easy. You just sign up and, and let us know if you need cards to, to share with folks, and we'll get them out to you. Uh, but basically, encourage your friends, your family, and ocean-related businesses that you deal with to take the pledge. Uh, when I met uh, with the folks from the Maui Ocean Center uh, today, they had a great idea, and I think we're going to pursue this, is on every island get the commercial tour operators, the dive, boat, uh, the dive boat operators, the dive shops together in a room, and talk to them all at once about the Coral Pledge. And so we'll, hopefully after uh, the first of the year, we'll put together some programs to do exactly that. And of course, uh, practice the pledge, as I'm sure you all do, on land and in the ocean. Uh, I assume you've heard about the 3030 Marine Initiative. It was actually announced back in 2016 by Governor Ige at the IUCN World Conservation Congress. It's the state's commitment to effectively manage 30% of Hawaii's nearshore ocean waters by 2030. And people have said, why 30%? Well, I'm not a policymaker or a scientist, so we're going to have to leave that answer to somebody else who can actually answer it. But that's one of the questions I had. Why only 30%? Why not 100%? But hopefully that's the goal long term. Effectively manage uh, refers to management actions that achieve desired outcomes and or goals. 30% uh, is just the starting goal Oops, go back. Uh, to facilitate the creation of a wide range of community-supported marine management areas across the main Hawaiian Islands. The 3030 Marine Initiative uh, will be a process that will be place-based, participatory, science and cultural informed, adaptive and based on partnerships with communities, organizations, and other government agencies. 
It includes the creation of new areas and ensuring existing areas are achieving goals using management plans and monitoring efforts to track progress and continually improve best management practices, or BMPs. The initiative aims to expand the DLNR Division of Aquatic Resources BMPs to ensure healthy ecosystems and abundant resources. I think I timed this and it's just skipping forward on me. So, which one are we at? Uh, management practices included, include place-based planning, monitoring, user management, restoration, and prevention. Pono practices, sustainable and environmentally responsible use of marine resources. Uh, monitoring multi-agency collaborations for data collection, citizen science contributions, and community-based monitoring. A lot of the things that the, the Maui Nui Marine Resources Council is already doing on the south and west shores here. Restoration and prevention address threats to nearshore ecosystems such as invasive species, coral restoration, and runoff. Uh, what's next from DAR? Uh, in 2020, the Division of Aquatic Resources will officially launch Holo Mao Pathway to 3030. Community engagement meetings across the state to gather input, ideas, and concerns evolving into community-driven plans focusing on select marine management BMPs ideal for each place. So I would encourage all of you in Maui Nui to watch for those meetings. I'm told that there's probably going to be about two dozen of them starting probably in March or April of next year. And I uh, really encourage your participation, your thoughts, and your ideas, and your uh, kokua. Uh, meetings will offer communities and all stakeholders the opportunity to engage with DAR staff and scientists. Uh, DLNR and DAR are committed to the initiative long term, even after the current administration is no longer in office. Uh, DLNR and DAR are committed to effective management actions derived from collaborative community-based planning and input, and we're committed to restoration, preservation, and perpetuation of Hawaii's unique and fragile marine ecosystems for today and the future. And that's all I have, and we have time for some questions. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and actually, I, I was going to read something that just came across my desk um, on Friday. As you know, the legislature only outlawed or is going to ban two of them, uh, oxybenzone and thank you. And as, as Jeff Bagshaw, you saw in the film, said, and if you've been out to Ahiki now in the last couple of years, if you can't say it, don't spray it. So I'm not going to try to say them. But here's some good news, and this came uh, from uh, actually our Division of State Parks, and it uh, relates to sunscreen use at Kealakekua, which was featured prominently in the film. This is to inform all commercial and non-commercial permittees of the new sunscreen and self-contained human waste system requirements that will take effect January 1st, 2020. Only reef-safe sunscreens, which does not contain oxybenzone or the other six or eight uh, ones that I can't pronounce, shall be allowed to be used by all visitors to Kealakekua Bay. It is encouraged that the wearing of sun protective clothing be utilized instead of sunscreen when practical. Commercial operators shall ensure that their customers follow these guidelines. Um, what's kind of happened within DNR, we're uh, you know, a big agency of 900 people, 11 different divisions, and understandably sometimes the divisions act in silos. So when we first started talking about resafe sunscreens, I think some people thought, ban everything except for the mineral-based sunscreens, the titanium oxide in, in, in those sunscreens. Uh, but then when it got to the legislature, they only banned the two. But now this is state parks saying we're going to ban them all in this one place. One of the proposals that I think is on the table now is to at least ban these in all of the marine life conservation districts around the state, which would include Hanama Bay, Kahalu Bay, uh, Ahikinau. And so, but there is a list. Um, and I'm not sure where it's readily available, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that for sure. I would think that the number of stores and the units used in this state is You can keep publishing that uh, so that it becomes a source of community education for the schools. It should be distributed to every school so the kids have it and should be. Because they'll just keep choosing the same things they've always chosen unless there's a very specific education process unless that list is really clear yep. and attain to it. Because if you have 50 items, that's really cool, but it's, if you've got 10 or 12 that people can actually recognize, it's a very different strategy for, for the government to pursue. They, if they're serious about it, if they're going to make more than a gesture at this, they've got to do serious education to get to that next level. Yeah, and I think one of the suggestions that I've heard is that uh, folks are going to keep going back to the legislature and say, you need to expand this to do exactly that. And I know. You said that you stopped selling sunscreens here, what, six, seven years ago? Six years. Yeah, all together. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of work to do for sure. And there's certainly a, 
a, a community that says ban them all. Uh, personally, I would support that, but again, I don't get to make the policy or vote on that. So let me go to the. There, there is a list, yeah. Um, probably the best place to get it is uh, the Hereticus Institute. Um, Dr. Craig Downs, who's been to Maui many times, who's been kind of the researcher who's done a lot of this. Um, and I'll check and see if, it, if there's not one on the DAR website. I'll see if we can't put one on the DAR website so it's easily available, readily available. Let me go to this gentleman yeah, first. I wanted to know if you've heard about a new technique that just came out of Australia to revive and reestablish a dead coral reef where they're putting an underwater speaker down and the underwater speaker plays and sounds a live coral reef and we found that the fish are all coming back onto the reef and starting to reestablish that. I did hear about it because I was standing next to you when you were talking to Amy on the sidewalk. <laughs> so it sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yes. so you can do a, anybody can do a search on uh, just put in uh, coral reef and speaker and you'll get like dozens of hits on it to find out about that. Great. I'll pass that along to the, the folks at DAR for sure. Let me go to this young lady back there with her arm up or whoever you can get the microphone to. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so I've noticed when you fly into Hawaii, you have to fill out a form from the USDA, and it's very careful about uh, vegetables and fruits, so there's a lot of protection of the land. But what I'm wondering is, while you're on the air airplane, why you can't also be given a form that says, um, do you have sunscreens like this? And they need to be taken out of your luggage the same way that they would take fruits and veggies. audience on the airplane so you can write you can have a video you can hand out flyers once people land at the airport you can have someone with a sandwich board wearing it and giving out sunscreen samples of safe sunscreen there's so many ways to do this and if we get a whole group of people to volunteer and get this started you know and change the laws we can actually really galvanize a lot of change because the constant flying in of new people every single day is what causes those 55 gallon barrels every day to go in the world. and I talked about that this afternoon, that uh, it's, it's too bad that Hawaii can't do uh, what Palau has done, where you have to sign a pledge and you actually have to donate some money to, to get enter, entrance into the country. I shared with him this afternoon, I'm from Mexico a lot to circle. There's a place on the Yucatan uh, Peninsula called uh, Yoku, and it was a great snorkeling spot. And this is probably 25 years ago, and every time you went there, man standing there and he would take his finger and touch your skin and if you had any oil you got to take a shower right there before you went in the water. I thought they did this in Mexico 25 years ago? What the hell's the matter with us? So, <laughs> so but you made a good point. Um, you know, this a lot of this stuff really starts with your lawmakers and so all of us talking to our lawmakers, uh, letting them know that this is important, you know, the, the key is really, and I, and I think the Tour operators realize this, as Russell said, on, on one level. I mean, we kill the corals, we kill the tourist industry. So there should be a lot of reason for protecting corals because that's what ultimately drives, you know, our, our economy overall. So unfortunately, I think we live in a society where you know money talks, and if we can put it in those terms with the folks that are making the decisions, I think we'll get their attention. And we are, and, and again, the the work that Maui Nui and a lot of other groups around the state are doing or getting there, but uh, it's just too bad there can't be one giant collaboration to, to make some of the things happen that you just mentioned, but I think great idea, great idea. And I'll, I'll take a lot of these back and, and pass them on to leadership, I guarantee you, so. Yes? Hi, I've been a, a diver here for about 45 years, and one of the things that I don't think gets addressed, but it's, it's really disturbing to me when I go out, is seeing fishing line all over the coral reefs. Yeah. Uh, stainless steel line, on filament line, great big huge lead weights. I mean, there's been times where I have to be down there with side cutters cutting the stuff loose, and I, I've seen turtles with the stuff wrapped around their necks and around their fins. And to me, it seems like one of the, the bigger threats out there. Because there's so much of it. I mean, it's just gotten worse and worse over the last few years. 
Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I don't dive much anymore, but I do snorkel a lot. And uh, Ocean Defenders, which was one of the early signatories of the Coral Pledge, they've actually committed to uh, go to Hanaba Bay uh, like once a month and clear out all the derelict fishing here. It's a, it's a huge problem throughout the Pacific. A lot of it is generated locally, but a lot of it's not generated locally. It just comes in. Uh, Camilo Beach on, on the Big Island have been out there a couple of times, and they just get you know tons and tons of this fishing gear that either gets dumped off boats or lost off boats. It's a, it's a major problem. And, um, you know, it's, it's tough because, again, you're dealing with an industry that has a lot of lobbying power, power and a, a lot of money and, you know, creates a lot of economic value for the state, clearly, and produces all the fish that I assume a lot of us like to eat on occasion. But, yeah, it's, a, it's another issue. It's, it's sometimes when I'm out interviewing people from DLR and some of our partners, I, one of the questions I always ask is, how do you keep doing this in the face of all the things that we're facing? And uh, almost to a person that are very optimistic and forward thinking, and a lot more than I tend to be, because sometimes I think, oh geez, if we don't get a handle on this stuff really quickly, you know, we're, we're, we're doomed to failure. Uh, if we're not already there, I hate to be a, a bearer of bad tidings, but it's, it's just, but again, I think you guys are in this room because you do want to do the right things and you are doing the right things. And I think all of us together, that's what we just have to keep striving for. I can hear you, but I don't have my glasses on. I can see you. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. One of the um, things on your list is to allow the, the fish to clean the reefs. And of course, we know the parrot fish and the herbivores are the ones that need the algae and keep the reef healthy. And in Hawaii, we don't have a law that keeps people from spear fishing at night where the, the parrot fish are sleeping and they just go in and go home with the spears when they're sleeping. And it's ridiculous. Many, many, many countries have uh, outlawed this. And that's only one of the things we need to do. We also need to put a moratorium on some of the reefs, especially the popular nearshore reefs where tourists uh, to snorkel, and not allow any fishing or spear fishing on those reefs for three or four years or five years. Give them a chance to recover. I've lived in Hawaii 45 years. I swim almost every day, and the diminishment of the fish on the reefs is just astounding. And you're right, we don't have a lot of time. This 30-30 plan would be great if it was 1960. But this is, this is almost 2020, and with global warming, and uh, the reef bleaching, and the injection wells not being uh, purified enough before they go in the water. And, and, and there's just a long list of the things that we could do to bring the reefs back to more health if we had the political will and the people making decisions. And there's no reason in the world if we're going to ban sunscreen next year to let all the stores selling the, the bad stuff sell it all one more year and get it all in the ocean between now and then. Yeah, you're What's right. the point? I know, you're right. But again, I would encourage you, I think the, the 30 by 30 marine initiative process is really a process to address a lot of the things that, that you just mentioned. I have heard, I don't know that there's a bill that's going to be introduced, but I have heard that there's uh, talk about introducing a bill that would, would ban night uh, spear fishing uh, for herbivores. And so um, again, talk to your legislators, but when these meetings come up and they'll be broadly announced, please go and make these same statements because they will be listening and, and you'll have a, uh, a chance to help formulate policy. Thank you. Um, so you said, doesn't DLNR uh, have the experts that recommend what kind of guidelines should be? Or are you, are you relying on politicians to make policy for our environment? Um, actually, we, we, we are not a science-based organization, so um, a lot of the science comes from, from partners. I mean, we do have some scientists, aquatic biologists or scientists, but a lot of it came from, from outside sources. Um, I think there was, a, there was a lack of political will to, to do a broader um, ban of sunscreens, and of course the cosmetics industry is a huge uh, voice when it comes to lawmakers, and they made, from what I understand, quite quite some noise about um, the, the extent of the sunscreen ban. But I don't think we've seen the last of it. I think you're going to see it expand from the, the two currently banned chemicals. 
uh, to, to hopefully something that's only mineral based. But as we were talking, there's still a lot of science out there undetermined about the mineral based. They may not be good either. And so I think the, the word that we like to spread is use rash guards, you know, protect yourself from the sun, uh, you know, go into the water during times of the day that you're not going to be in that direct noontime sun and really getting burned. You know, use hats, stay in the shade, things like that. Well, I mean more about sustainable fishing. What, sustainable who, fishing, yeah. Who determines that? And, and how do uh, aquarium trade people take millions of fish off the reef? Um, and why are they still killing all the herbivores if they're the ones that are going to save the reef? Good question, but um, I'm, <laughs> I can't get into policy and politics because that's well out of my, my lane. So, um, I, I mean, I hear you. Um, who makes the policies for uh, the rules? The rules? Um, well, they, they come from the divisions. It depends. The statutes come from the legislature. If they're administrative rules, which a lot of these things are administrative rules, they're approved by the Board of Land and Natural Resources, which is a board of six folks that meet. Uh, twice a month, and they're actually the policy overseers of, of everything that we do. So everything goes through this through this board that's appointed by the governor. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.